This is all about research and data, um, aka I would call this the Naughty Kids panel. So these <laughs> selection of people here are going to keep you more than entertained because there is a selection of characters to my right. <laughs> So, I will very briefly introduce, but they will introduce themselves. Joy is a patient but has a clinical science background. Joy's going to talk to us about why patients should get involved in research. Jonathan is going to call, uh, talk about his app for clinical trials. <coughs> Who knows what Charles and Orlando will end up talking about, but they should be talking about data and research. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Joy. Thank you. I don't know if that's good being one of the naughty boys or not, actually, but uh, my name's Joy. I am a WM person, and I have been a WM person for two years, so I'm a relative newbie to this. Um, but my background was that I, um, I, my first degree was in um, physiology and biochemistry, and I started work on clinical trials with the NHS when I started work. And I gradually worked through that. I got into different types of research, and then into what's now called quality improvement working with patients to improve the services that patients get in uh, they, were, they were just general hospitals that I was working in. So I was thinking about when I was asked to do this, why is it that I want to be involved in research? Because when I was diagnosed, okay, I've got the background I have, but one of the first questions I asked was, well, are there any clinical trials that I can be involved in? So um, why did I want to, why did I ask that question? <coughs> I wanted to find out what will help me. I want, to find, I want to live the best life I can for as long as I can, and I want it to be as healthy as it is, and I want to do all the things that we've talked about today. So we need the, good, the best evidence that we can get from all of our data to allow me to live the best life. But I'm not entirely selfish. Um, I want to find out uh, what will help all of you as well, and not only you, but my children's generation and their children's generation and going on and on. So I want patients to be involved with research so we have a huge vat of information because we're all different. We know that from WM. You've only got to look at us. You've only got to join the groups, the support groups that I'm part of, that I expect many of you are part of as well. And you know we're very different. Um, it's not just the older white man, as we've found that out. It, we've heard today from some of the young patients we've got from different ethnicities. We've had different um, treatments. We've got different symptoms. And all those, we need to think about how, how, do we, how do we work out the best treatment for us as an individual. I also want to find out about data beyond clinical outcomes because the clinicians need to know all that stuff. But I want to know what it's going to be like for me. I want to know the answers to some of the questions that are, the patients ask that, that makes my life different. I'm the one that was told, oh, actually, you've got Waldenstrom's. In fact, you've got a cancer. I was the one that had to go home and tell my family and my children, uh, guess what, mum's got this disease. They hadn't heard of it before. Um, and I want to know the answers to some of the questions that then bubble in my head that oh, we only people that have had to do that will actually know. So I also want to focus research on what's important from a patient's perspective. So that's the very beginning of research. So it's not just the outcomes, it's how we decide what we're going to do the research on. And it's important to get in there really early um, and to find out the questions, to ask the questions that are important to us. And as I was saying, we're all so different. Um, just think about the sorts of questions that you want to know the answers to. Now, it's not just research, it's not just clinical trials. Um, we are, we've talked a lot about clinical trials today, um, and I think that's been really, really helpful, but there are other sorts of research as well that will give us some of the answers to some of the questions that I've just been talked about, I've been talking about. There's people here at the front bench, and Oliver and Nicole are somewhere around who work on the Rory Morrison Registry, which is the WM Registry. Um, and they know a lot more about this than, than I do, um, but it's something that I think we've really all got to get to grips with and we've got to make sure our data is being added to it. The patient reported outcome measures, the quality of life surveys, it's all really useful data that will help. You can break it down by the different types of people, the different sorts of treatment, the different ages, um, their different genetic makeup to work out exactly how the, the best treatment works. So, what is a, a registry? We've heard that it generates real-world observational um, evidence. That's really, really important. 
Um, it can quantify disease outcomes. So if we've got a huge population, which would be ideal of all the WMOs that we possibly can, we can see what uh, the outcomes are for us over a period of time. So it's really important you start as soon as you're, you possibly can and you keep going for as long as you possibly can. Um, it can help show what happens as the disease progresses. So we will know, it, looking back on the data, what happens to people just like me, what happens to them as they progress through um, their journey with WM. And it can help work out what risks there are to patients in the future, and that will help us think about, um, uh, I know we've been talking about being the here and now as much as we can, that's really, really true. But I certainly, my mind does wander, and I do want to think about what are the likely things that are coming down the track at me. And if we know what the history is of a lot of people like us, um, we can get some idea about that. Um, and it helps assess the impact on patients because some of the questions you've, you've seen um, and you will see when you certainly look at um, the, the sorts of things that are on the app about how we feel, um, how anxious we are. We've talked a lot about fatigue. Um, it tells you um, the impact on us as we go through um, our journey. So why did I want to be um, uh, involved in research? Why was I so keen about this? I want to inform you and me and my friends and my families. We've talked a lot about how do you tell people. When people say, how are you, what do you say? Um, and I think it, we've talked a lot about the initial response to that, about um, it deals with you as a personality and who it is that you're talking to. But I want to know um, a lot about um, why I'm, uh, why Waldenstrom's, why this, um, why has it happened to me? Um, and those are some of the things it starts me thinking about when I'm answering some of these questions, these questionnaires. Um, it helps with discussions about our care. The more you get involved in this, the more you think about your care, um, the, the really you can then start formulating how it feels um, to you. It's made me think more about having the condition just by having to answer some of these questions. Um, it identifies what effective and safe um, and to inform care guidelines. That's really important. Um, I've happened to have been on a nice committee as a lay member, not for Waldenstrom's, for something completely different. But looking at all the evidence, you need lots of evidence to get the guidelines produced um, so that we know the best way to treat us. So please, please um, carry on um, uh, collecting the evidence. It's also important the chance of getting funding for further research. It's a bit like a chicken and egg. You need to have done the research to get the funding. Um, you need to have the funding to get to do the research. So um, you do need to keep this going, um, get as much as we can published. Um, I know now, uh, when I was starting um, my career in research, there wasn't Google. There wasn't even those of you that are old enough can remember Alta Vista and Yahoo and things like that. Before all that even, there wasn't Medline online. Uh, I literally had to go to the library and look up these huge volumes, encyclopedias of evidence. So the evidence, is be, once it's been written, it's produced and it's published, we can find it, but we've got to have the data to publish the papers. So again, we've got to go back to, we all need to be involved um, to collect the data. So what can we do? Ask about research opportunities. Please, please go back to where, or oh, I've got that as the next point actually, but do ask about what, what's, what research you can be involved in, not just WM. If you look at your NHS app, you can register, you can see there, have your name put on, yes, in, you know, ask me about research. If you want to know people like me, um, you can do that through the N NHS app and they will contact you and send you um, uh, ideas about research. So, so look at um, research opportunities. Please contribute. We need loads and loads of data. Do not stop contributing. That's, that's not, no good either. So once you've started, just keep going. And I know I get proms sent to me and I think, oh, it's going down my email list and I'll get round to it sometime. Uh, don't do that. Just sit down. Get yourself a cup of builders and a hobnob or whatever or a glass of wine or whatever it is. Sit down and please... Fill it in. And also, don't worry if nothing's changed. Don't think you've only got to send in your responses when things have changed. And a, a similar, you know, if things haven't changed, is just as important to know as if loads of things have changed. So um, please, please, please contribute. 
Make sure your centre's taking part. Um, this goes back to the registry, but uh, ask about research opportunities. And just go back and ask. Um, we've, we heard about the Rory Morrison registry, the number of centres that are taking part. But we're, in, we're patients. We need to hassle. If your, your centre's not taking part, you need to be um, asking why. Um, and think about where we need new evidence. Um, there's a, there is a research committee attached to WMUK, um, and that's, again, um, thinking about where we need to be looking from the patient's perspective um, for ideas for research. So get in at the beginning. We're the patients. We need to use our influence. The clinicians are doing a fantastic job, but they need our help to collect the data so that they know what to do with us, basically. So I'm going to finish there, um, and I'm handing on to Jonathan, who's going to talk about some of the tech that's available. There we go. Excellent. Thank you, Joy. That was really, really interesting and a detailed look at everything that can be done on, in terms of research. Um, I'm Jonathan, I'm the uh, founder of Stitch, and what we do, we have an application that helps people on earlier phase clinical trials, so phase one to three um, clinical trials, know what they need to do and why and when. Um, so we talked a little bit before about clinical trials and sort of some of the work involved, and we exist to make that experience as easy as possible for, for those trial participants. The question that we pose is, how do we make this as simple and accessible as possible? And in this talk, I'll, I'll take you through a case study that we've worked on with WMUK and a major uh, pharma company um, who are doing research in WM and how we got patient input into some of the clinical study materials, the application to make sure um, this experience was as good as possible, why we did it what we did and the impact this had. And then Charles will share his experiences of actually participating in that, in that focus group, uh, what he saw and all of the suggestions that he had on things that we should change and make better. Um, but before that, though, I'd like to share a quick personal story as to why I work in this space, uh, why I founded Stitch, and sort of why I'm here today. Um, this slightly fuzzy picture is a picture of my father's sort of medical records and notes and everything that he printed. He had WM. Uh, he was diagnosed in the early 80s, uh, was under fantastic care, um, but his journey still was complicated, and he wasn't even in a clinical trial. And, you know, I saw how hard this was for him to manage, and, you know, knowing what patients on a clinical trial then have to do on top, there's an opportunity to make this easier and simpler. So that's why I founded Stitch. Uh, we're a technology... Keep pressing next. I can hear it going. There we go. Um, we're a technology company that exists to make uh, the, every clinical trial participant feel supported and heard. So there's two sides to what we do. Support patients to navigate the clinical trial and understand what they need to do, but then provide their feedback. And that feedback on their clinical trial experience is then used to make it better and reduce the burden for other patients on the study. And the case study that we did was working with WMUK to get patient input on the study materials and the application. Uh, and so we ran a focus group. But why do that? Why actually involve patients? Well, there's, there's a number of reasons, really. One is you get better study information that's clearer and easier to understand. <coughs> That's really important, that things are written in a way that patients really can, and people on the trial can really sort of understand. But also that you, that you we build our, our um, technology with patients. We design it with patients. We make sure it's usable. We make sure it's easy to use. We make sure it covers what people want and, and, and is sort of, that's the only way to build technology that's fit for purpose, that you know people can use. But it also was an opportunity to help the pharma company that we were working with deeply understand the condition uh, and how it affected people day to day and how to create sort of an experience that was more, more compelling for those participants. So what did we do? We, first, we had to find people and volunteers. So that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here today is that was, that was through WMUK and there's an opportunity as well to, to find more people to support. We ran a focus group 
we analyzed the output. You can see there that there were 36 pages in the transcript from the focus group. We have, you know, it, I think it was over 14,000 words. It was, um, uh, I think, over 113 separate bits of feedback that we received to change either materials or things in the application. We made those changes within a few days, actually got them signed off by the pharmaceutical company, and then shared the outcome. Um, I won't go into too much details to what we changed as a result. The short summary is we made it less jargony and much simpler. That was the main thing. We, we, we just made it much, much easier. I think Charles will go into some of this detail. But if you look at this and you flip it the other way, when we're doing the next studies in this condition, these are the things that we know we need to cover. We already have that initial map as to how we can start in a better place. And we made sure we thanked everybody. That's really important. We made sure we closed that loop and made sure that information goes back um, to the people that, that participated and contributed. And so the, the point here is you don't have to be necessarily a clinical trial participant to help with the clinical trial research. If you share feedback, you share your lived experiences and you educate the industry, that can then be used to improve the trial experience um, and better support people on trials. So really grateful to all the people that participated and hope there will be more and more opportunities to hear what you have to say so that we can make trials better. I'll hand over to Charles. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I won't get up because it'll embarrass you to watch me hobble across the stage. Well, it'll embarrass me, never mind you. Um, the, import, the important thing about this was that this was a different way of contributing to research. So that's part of why we want to make the point today. The other thing is it had an impact. You know, the result of the focus group, so it wasn't just me, there were other people involved in this. That's important to recognise. But what was really significant and I think made it justified was the list of alterations to the app that we proposed and that was out of a focus group so you know it wasn't it wasn't a huge amount of time wasn't a huge amount of effort for us it was a, maybe an hour and a half i think the focus group and out of that came 35 different improvements to the app that were made so 79 percent of what we represented i don't know how we weren't a math now, but as you know the majority of what we said was paid attention to and was implemented and I think that's really important because that means that we can all make a difference to this stuff very easily and it will make it better for all of us to use and to go back to what was being said earlier on, we need more data. The more we know about this, and it sounds, it's, particularly with WM, it seems to be it's more about the life experience of it because it's an incurable disease that's really significant and actually there's not a huge amount of data. We're very fortunate in having the registry so we've got information about 1,000 patients and we've got 200 people doing patient-reported outcomes on a six-monthly basis. We've got 24 centres, that's hospitals treating people with WM, contributing to the registry. We want more and we want more people. We've got 1,000. There's about 4,000 people in the UK with WM, living with WM, so we've only got 25% of them. I'd like to have three out of every four. I'd like to have 75%. That'll give us a statistically significant group of people which will increase the amount of research that can be done using that Rory Morrison registry. So it's really, I want to be the champion of the registry. So if anybody's got any issues about it, my email address will be appearing on the website, apparently. <laughs> it's going to be hacked into, I should imagine. Um, so if you've got any issues about the registry or if you've got any issues when you raise it with your hospitals, because... It's not, necessarily not as straightforward as you putting the data in. Again, come back to me and we can help you in those discussions with your, you know, your team at the hospital. Okay, thank you very much. Is it me next? Right, um, I think I'm last. Um, and I think my, my slides are all good. Listen, thank you all for having me. So I want to thank Jane, Kat... Shelley um, and the team for making this all happen. I might be slightly longer, but I've got 20 minutes. But before I do that, I have met the most extraordinary people on the planet today. Penny, Robert, Christine, absolute legends. So thanks, Jane, for making it happen. Um, for those of you who have not met, because I couldn't make my way through the room, I'm Orlando. 
Um, you can hear me, right? Okay. <laughs> I'm Orlando Agrippa. I head up um, a company called Sonia's Help. And um, I gave um, Jane and Kat a really tough time in sort of organizing this from my end today because I like to meet people first before I decide what I talk about, right? So they chased me down for these slides, but um, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to talk about. And from meeting Penny, Robert, Christine, and others, I thought I'd share a story, um, which is why I'm here. So not that long ago, I don't have WM, um, but not that long ago, I, um, I, I thought I was dying. And this is sort of how this story goes, right? And for Shirley and others who know it, um, I won't, you, know, you guys will forgive me for, for telling it again. But um, my background is I grew up in South America. I was born in South America. A long time ago, I studied to be a software engineer. I joined the NHS. I did that for about 16 years. I then did the same thing in Australia and the Middle East. So healthcare, I know relatively well. And then not so long ago, I go out for this run. Um, and I go to, um, to, to Monaco. Um, and as I get back to the foyer of the hotel, and the last time I was in Birmingham, by the way, this thing happened, right? But anyway, as I get back to the foyer of the hotel, my brain disconnects itself from my body, and in like a nanosecond. But when it returns, it returns with the most excruciating pain I've ever encountered. It's so painful that I black out. I, they rush me to Princess Grace of Monaco, they sedate me and they run all these tests and they can't figure out what's happening. But in between all of this, I'm screaming, I'm coming back, I'm going out. Anyway, I wake up twice. The first time, um, I'm sure we've all had these dreams. You've probably had these dreams where you are trying to wake yourself up, but you can't wake up and you're screaming and you're probably crying. So this is happening, but it's in real life, right? So I'm not dreaming. The second time I wake up, um, I wake up probably two weeks in and um, I'm unable to speak, um, I'm, I can't walk, um, I'm you know, heavily sedated because they don't know what's wrong with me. And um, I come through about two days in and I decide that I don't speak fluent French, um, or at least I don't think I do. So since everyone's speaking French, I should try to escape from this hospital and get back to the UK. So I get a helicopter back from um, uh, Monaco to Nice, a BA flight from Nice to France, and back to um, London City Airport, and I get myself admitted to Bart's Health, um, uh, Robert's old hospital, right? Um, and my old hospital as well. And I meet this guy called Paul, um, and, um, and Paul um, tells me, aha, um, you've got this hematological disorder and this is how it works. And there's you know, X amount of people in the UK with it, and this is, there's no cure, et cetera. I, um, it takes me about a year to process this, because I, like, I don't know why I couldn't figure out what he was telling me. And I went back, and I said to Paul, I would like to dedicate my life's work to helping patients with this disease and every single con um, patient that I can find with a rare and um, a, a hematological disorder. So I put together a tiny war chest. Um, I say tiny, it's a lot of money, right? Um, going into the millions. And I decided to start to help patients for free, starting with me. And the first thing we did was try to answer a question that Paul had. And Paul is, um, you know, a really, I think he's an extraordinary hematologist, which was, how do I have better visibility of what's happening to Orlando when he's not in clinic with me, right? So we looked across the planet and we looked for the best FDA or regulatory device that I can find that didn't look like a clinical device. And the one on my hand um, is um, the best we could find. But what it tracks, it looks like a normal watch, but it's not. It tracks sleep on, on Charles's hand as well. Maybe it's not his favorite, but um, it tracks sleep. <laughs> Uh, we've got, anyway, we've got the same one, but um, it tracks sleep, SpO2, ECG, basically your blood oxygen levels, now temperature and a number of things. Um, we then decided to get all of my genome sequenced to figure out what are all of the other things that's wrong with me. And there's some pretty unhelpful things that will turn up, hopefully never turn up, but it will, I think it might turn up. Um, we then, um, for two years, I entered in a sheet almost like the one that I'm that Charles mentioned earlier, everything that was happening to me, so pain, psychological score, hydration, fatigue, etc. And I kept sending it back to Paul, right? Um, and then we get all of my medical records, not as thick as Jonathan's dad's pile, um, because they've not been around for as long, but um, all of my medical records, both primary and secondary care, to figure out why this happened to me. 
And that is the genesis of what Sonia's Health is. This happened the last time I was in Birmingham in April. So this is an email from me to Paul, um, and it, it, they took the data out. But this, um, this thing that happened in Monaco happened again. But in my bag, there's an enormous amount of morphine and lots of stuff for if this thing turns up again, we will nuke it, right? There's no cure, as I said, but you, like pretty strong drugs. Um, and I sent this to Paul from my, um, from my watch to say, hey, I've measured, I've got all of these vitals, and I think this one might be interesting for you to look at. What do you think? And Paul, being the extraordinary doctor that he is, mobilizes and gets me a bed in an ambulance um, in Birmingham to ensure that I'm all right. So that is why um, I'm here. That's why I do what we do. And we are committed to not just doing it for the condition I've got, but for every possible hematological um, malignancy and or, or disorder and or rare disease we can find. So we don't make watches um, and we don't make lots of things, right? We, as I said, we found the best one we could find. So we buy hundreds of thousands of devices and this is one of the companies that we use um, and these are the devices that I've got on. But I'm sure the team will send you stuff on email and you'll, you'll be able to talk to us about this a bit more. This is... Um, and this is something else I learned from both Christine, um, Penny, and, and Robert, that the app that we've built is built for, well, it works really well for me. But what we've discovered today, which I was saying to Harriet, um, it's really, I'm really, really glad that I, I, I came today, is that we will need to build something very specific or curate something very specific for this extraordinary group. So don't worry, I'm on top of it, right? Um, but this is what, um, this is real data, by the way. This is what the dashboard looks like, which tells me everything that's happening. And this is all of the data that comes out of all of those areas that I've discussed. Um, fundamentally, what we are focused on doing, and I know lots of people talked about fatigue, et cetera, but across all hematological um, malignancies and disorders, fatigue is one of the biggest things that we've been seeing both in WM, in sickle, in CAD, in um, MPNs, in CMLs, fatigue is a really, it's a real challenge for everyone. So for us, as an as a area of focus, what we are keen to do is not only provide um, uh, patients or people living with, with these conditions with wearable devices and an app, but provide them with as much support as we possibly can um, to help to make it make sense. Because I can guarantee you, even though I run Sinus Health, I don't put my outcomes in every day. Like, it's, like I forget some days, right? Even though I get prompted. But what's helpful is knowing that there's something that's automatically reading some of this data, which can help from a research perspective. Um, I'll skip through some of this, because um, I know we're, we're tied on time. What I'm, or what we're preoccupied with are these things. So for me, this is slightly selfish in that I would like to find a cure um, and ensure that on that journey, we all have extraordinary um, experiences and outcomes. That's it, right? Now, there's no cure for the thing that I've got. And like WM, um, I know there's no cure. And the last guys that attempted it, they activated a cancer um, gene, which wasn't so great. So um, we we'll still, we'll still got a bit of a way to go on it. But um, I also wanted to put this in the slide deck because I wanted to give you a sense of our commitment to um, hematological disorders and malignancies. So yellow is obviously WM, which we're committed to. And we're doing a lot of work with Jane, Shirley, and others, both from a research perspective, but also from, kind of, from this perspective. But I think one of the things to note about all of these conditions is, I believe, and I could be wrong, and I'm sure the clinicians will have um, views on this, that there are a lot of commonalities across these, these diseases. And I think that getting closer to a cure and or better outcome, at least for me, will come from combination therapy. So things that have been tried in other diseases that might work in the one that I've got, right? Um, so what's the impact? All right, I'll pick up the pace now, right? Um, so this is me, again, this is real data, right? And the blue little squiggly lines are everything that's coming off of this device. And the gray bits represent um, the temperature outside, right? 
And that big yellow represent when um, this Monaco thing happened, it's called a vasoclusive crisis. And you can see the things that happen around it. So fever, um, night sweats. So what I had to do with these night sweats, I had to get three or four lots of towels and put them on the radiator and just switch them out all night. Right, it was a real, it was eclectic, um, to say the, the least, right? So I think definitely there's some commonalities, as you can, because lots of people talked about night sweats earlier. Um, but while this was happening, and I was in, in um, a bed, and or I think this happened when I was in an ambulance, um, because when this thing kicks in, you're in so much pain, cognitively, you just can't focus. But having this device on allowed me to track what was happening. So both from a sort of a pain score, psychological score, um, uh, quality of life, this is manually entered. But it gives you a sense of, in grey, basically, is um, what um, my normal pain levels look like. And the yellow represent the movement, right? So if you follow grey being normal and yellow being change, you can see what that looks like when this thing's happening. But again, it's helpful to not have to enter stuff, but have it captured. Um, this just gives you a, a more in-depth look at what that looks like. So while I'm having one of these things, and I'm sure everyone's drawn the parallel now to WM and how you might you know, think of the utility of this, but from a, you know improvement or reduction in quality of life, in spike in pain score, obviously less hydration, sleep, being a real issue, etc. This is what happens, um, and it's really helpful from an evidence generation perspective, not just for research, but for me as a patient to have it, to be able to say what is happening to me, and how do I have a better, more informed discussion with with Paul and my physicians. Fatigue, our old friend, right? So this is literally no one else has seen this on the planet beside you today. Um, it's true. Um, so we've got, I think, globally the largest base of patients that we support. Um, and what we've been looking at is what can we do from a research perspective, and we've not published this yet, in, in terms of um, fatigue. And I'll make it make sense here, right? So we've looked at, I forgot how many patients this represents, I think it's about 500, but um, from July, um, we've been tracking hundreds of patients to see if all of the things that we're supporting them with has been making a difference to fatigue. And I don't know that I can point to one thing that is, you know, this is what you do. But what I know is through a combination of things that both patients are doing and we're trying to support with, it's been helping that to be slightly better. So I think that's definitely something that we've got in common, um, if, if, even if we don't have the same condition, right? Um, this, I know some of the clinicians in um, Amsterdam or the Netherlands spoke about mental health. So for the condition I have, I think the stat is, I think the stat earlier was 24% of most people in this room with WM um, will, or in, with WM period, will have um, some challenges around mental health. For the condition I've got, it's, I think, 35%, right? So it's pretty high. So one of the things that we are preoccupied with, and we're working with some of the best um, mental health physicians in the country, is to try to understand how we can provide, or at least partner with people who provide services around psychological um, support and or well-being for patients living with rare conditions. I'm almost there, don't worry, all right? This, so the team in the court, these lights are really bright. So if I'm squinting, it's because like they're in my eye. But the team in the corner, which um, kindly gave up their Saturday to join me today, um, speak to lots, hundreds of patients. And these are some of the things that we pick up from some of our patient discussions, which allow us to think about how we can, um, and by we, in this case, will be you know, WM as a, as a charity, but how we can curate services um, to better match the issues that patients are flagging up um, uh, uh, in terms of a sort of a, you know, improved service provision. Clinical trial, going back to Jonathan's piece, is a massive thing. It's so massive that we've put together half a million quid to fill a room with 2,000 patients next year. Um, um, and WM will be a key part of that. To, and not just WM patients, patients from all hematological disorders and malignancies to figure out how we make clinical trials less shitty. Um, so hopefully that will be helpful.
because it's a lot of money to point at that problem. And hopefully Jonathan will be there as well, right? <laughs> um, this bit, I'm almost there. So this is not um, something that I think will happen now for WM unless we can crack it together with Jane, Charles, etc. But one of the things that we've been quietly doing, um, we started with me and then we've extended out to lots of our patients is, and we then figured out globally um, that lots of other clinicians were preoccupied with it is, how can we, and I've not drawn the parallel to WM yet, but maybe you can, how can we predict when that Monaco thing will happen to me again before it happens, right? So we've built out some AI and every day across a large group of patients, it predicts um, when they might have one of these crises. So this is me. Again, this is new, right? This is data from earlier this week. And you can see all of these lightning bolts in pink represents um, every time I've reported on the app that I think I'm having one. Um, and then it tells you all of the things that are happening to me. And you can see our old friend fatigue. I couldn't have made this up quickly enough today. So you know it's true, right? Um, uh, popping up. So I think fatigue, um, not necessarily lack of sleep, because I thought it was lack of sleep before, but fatigue and this thing are cousins. And um, at the moment, we're trying to crack it. So that, um, hopefully, I'm almost there, <laughs> that hopefully helps you to get a really good sense of why, who we are, what we do, um, uh, and why we've partnered with WM. And, and I've said to, to, you know, to Jane and some, some of us in the room, we are ultra committed to a very you know, long and hopefully valuable journey for patients and people living with WM in this room. And hopefully we think that some of the things that we've done in other disease areas can transfer over to help. So I think that's it. Um, and I think I've done 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Right, um, thank you so much to all our speakers there. And um, we're going to take some questions now um, from the room. So you put your hand up and I'll run over to you. Anyone? Then all put all of your hands up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, it's really not so much a, a question as a comment. When people have been talking about symptoms, uh, I was first diagnosed 13 years ago when I had treatment, and I'm currently going through my second session of treatment, two-thirds of the way through. But um, there were things that were symptoms that I didn't recognize as symptoms. And when I was, I'm at a hospital where I'm the only patient <laughs> with, with this illness. Uh, and I was asked, what were my symptoms? And, and when I was first treated at Bart's 13 years ago, they had a long list of symptoms. And you could say, oh, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that. But recognizing one's uh, symptoms is not necessarily easy. I just thought, well, you know, I'm getting older. There we go. I, I think you've made a really good point. Thank you. And, and Charles, I do you want to speak on the mic? Is that, is that better? Yeah. I think you've made a really good point. I felt exactly the same when I was diagnosed, that there were loads of things that I just thought, well, they're things that happen in life. You know, you're getting older or whatever. And mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that we do this additional data collection to be able to pick up, I don't know what you, whether you call type, B-type symptoms or whatever, the, the, the minor things that we kind of just tend to disregard, yeah. but actually they're much more significant because I never really listened to my body till I had WM. And then I suddenly started paying attention to what it was trying to tell me. And it's amazing, you know, I disregarded it because you're focused on your professional life or your marriage or kids or whatever. So you, you, there's a lot of stuff that you just put to one side. Actually, that stuff's really significant because we need to understand more about what it is with living with the disease. So we have to record those minor things that in the past we didn't take any notice of. So I absolutely agree with you, and that's why I think this stuff is so important. And Charles, like just to add to that, has the <laughs> has the app 
helped you in terms of actually thinking about those symptoms? Um, I know you've been trialling it in the last couple of weeks. Well, I, was, I, I capture an awful lot of information. I'm a bit of a nerd, as I think I confessed to earlier on today. I capture an awful lot more about my health now because I've started paying attention to it since I've had WM. So I have, there's a lot more stuff on my phone that I actually, you know, which is automatically collected, as people have said. But filling in the, the PROMS questionnaire every six months has been a, a good thing to make me think about, sit and think for a couple of minutes about how do I actually feel? Yeah, and I think filling, doing it daily as I've been doing it with the watch. One, it's it's good to capture stuff automatically through the watch, and secondly, yes, you think about at the end of the day, how have you felt that day? And I mean, that's not all bad because you actually realise sometimes I've had a bloody good day. I felt fantastic, but I didn't notice <laughs> till I stopped and thought about it because you're having fun. So I, I, I do think it's it's important to go through the discipline of capturing this stuff. I don't think it's going to, it's no miracle cure, but it is going to tune you in a bit more. I mean, maybe it's a bloke thing, but I mean, we're just not tuned into our bodies. Well, we are at one stage, but I won't go into that. But I mean, you know, it, it was quite a jolt to me, and I'm 69, I think. Um, it was quite a jolt to me to stop work and actually say, I, I deliberately said, I'm going to stop work because I need to pay attention to my body to address this disease. And as a consequence, and I'm, I want to know everything about it, just like somebody else said earlier on today. I want to know everything about it because I'm a bit of a control freak. If I know stuff, I think I've got some influence over what's going to happen. Whereas when I was first diagnosed, I was completely blind, completely deaf, and probably dumb. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I think probably the, the si single biggest thing that I've picked up today is about fatigue, um, thanks to Vern. Um, because the things that he said in a very human language were the things that I've experienced for a very, very long time, which then the jigsaw pieces kind of yeah. fell into place when I was um, diagnosed with WM. Linking that to this app and smartwatch, which I think is a really, really positive thing to do, I'd be really interested... Uh, if you could answer something around this question is like what happens in about six months time or 12 months time do we as uh, users get reports back on it how, do, how does that how does that actually kind of transfer back to us because I can understand about giving up lots of forensic data and it being used but how is that what would I see back in return for that yeah it's a really good question I think the the, the short answer is um, when we started and today, our focus, a secondary outcome is that you can do lots of really good research and support other patients with this. But our primary objective, which is slightly selfish from my perspective, is how can we give you and me better visibility of our own health? So you do get, like within it, there's a report. But also, if you need us to pull together sort of a custom report, I'll send, I'll send you an example of mine, then that exists. But what we've been seeing, and what I've been doing, because I've copied them, is lots of patients have been turning up to their appointments, and the discussions have been a lot more forensic. So what has been happening in between contact? Well, this is exactly what's been happening. And by the way, I've not reported my sleep on manually. It's automatically um, captured, so you know I've slept badly. And these are the things that have been happening around my world. So I think the two greatest utilities for me and for other patients, I think, so far has been, one, how do I have a better discussion with Paul? Literally, I had a consultation yesterday. I added it to the slides, but I deleted it, which I sent him while we were talking exactly what was happening. And he said, oh, this was really helpful, because now we know the things that we talked about three months ago versus now is either gotten better or worse. So... Yes, it's a short answer to a report, but it's predominant, our primary focus is how do we help you to have better visibility, and then everything else is secondary. Uh, yes, I think one of the problems, though, is that to keep patients involved, they need to be able to see what, what the outcome is for everybody. So we need to be working towards... So if you do have one of these watches and you're getting your data, you also need then to be able to see, well, how's everybody else doing? You know, how do I get into that? So I think we really do need to be getting on to... to I mean, this is early, very, very early days, but that's no, where we need to be going. A good one, and I'll respond to it really quickly. So within that report, what it says... I should have brought it. I just don't have my... It's in my bag. But anyway, what it says is, Orlando, this is how you compare to the rest of the cohort. 
of people like you, right? Because I think it's always a good barometer in terms of how have you, I've slept badly, but does that mean everyone in WOM sleeps badly or everything else or fatigue, etc.? So we always try to benchmark it against a cohort, obviously anonymized, um, <laughs> so you know what that looks like. Um, hi, yeah, no, I just wondered um, how are clinicians going to be involved with this at some point? So I, I, I get how important it is for your clinician to see that data and to be able to give you feedback about stuff, but for it to work for us WM patients, how will the clinicians be involved? Yeah, so everything that we do, and I'll hand over to other people as well, everything that we do starts with patients and clinicians. So there is no condition that we're in where it's not clinically led. For example, I know that with Jane, um, Harriet, um, uh, Shirley, um, and the sort of clinical um, uh, um, research group at um, WMUK, we're working on a protocol which will go through ethics, et cetera, where there'll be a specific group of patients who will consent in, um, sorry, who will consent in to be able to fundamentally do this, but from a science perspective, right? But equally, one of the things that we're seeing from the NHS, so from doing what we've done in other diseases, we've been able to have a massive and positive impact on the NHS's front door and bed base. So less patients pitching up, et cetera. So now the NHS is working with us to be able to use the same approach to monitor patients, as in clusters of patients within the community, to help them with different services. But it's all clinically led. Um, uh, and our team has got a number of clinicians on it as well. <laughs> just, can I just answer that from a very, very personal point of view? When I've been to uh, outpatient clinics, I'm treated at, at the church or it's, I, I voice record them because you only retain, you know, when you're in a presentation, you only pick up 10% of it or whatever. But also, it's when the clinician asks me, how am I, my first response is okay. Yeah. You know, and that's not the bloody answer. So having some data, even if I've written notes to myself on my phone about, you know, I'm suffering for, from fatigue or whatever, helps that conversation be much more valuable. Because if I say to the clinician, I feel okay, and unless they can see visibly that I'm suffering, that's the answer they've got to take. So actually having data and information with you, and clinicians, dare I say, are used to looking at data and numbers and all the rest of it, then it's going to help the conversation, I think. So I think, I take the point about involving clinicians. There are some apps that are shared by clinicians and patients. There, there are good examples of that. I think that's difficult to do, but I think in the first instance, if you've got some data about yourself and how you feel, that will help you have a better conversation when you have your uh, clinical meetings. Can, can I just say, one, uh, in response to your question, the protocol that's being drawn up has been through the clinical and patient advisory boards. It's, it's a proper protocol with clinical outcomes and measures, and we plan to, you know, analyze it in detail and ultimately publish and draw bring on bring uh, you know build on this going forward so it is a scientific study that we're doing how long do you see the project with the watch going on I mean are, are we now having a watch for life almost <laughs> yeah. so it's it's, <laughs> it's 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 a good question so um, across, I forgot the exact number, but let's, let's assume 500 um, patients in another disease. It's been happening for three years. Um, and our commitment to patients, so we don't, you know, there's never a transaction between us and patients ever. That's always very clear. But our commitment to patients is as we, because as technology evolves, we will try to get the next. Um, latest version to evolve the insights that you receive. So, for example, when I started, there was nothing that could capture um, temperature. And then I met Shirley, and Shirley, um, I think, I forgot who was on the panel this morning that talked about CAD, but Shirley mentioned that CAD 
is, I think, CAD is very sim similar in some cases to the condition I've got. But in CAD, we would need to capture temperature, right? So now we've got a new version of the device that captures temperature and all of the other things. So, so far, three years is the shorter answer. And I don't imagine that it will stop at three years because we will simply enhance and evolve it. I think for this particular project, we thought about 12 months, didn't we? Yeah. I, I think, yeah, we were thinking about 12 months for this WME study. So the watch is for two Christmases, not one. We won't be asking for the watch ever back. Despite the fact I asked for mine back today. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have to admit that before t today, I, I, I hadn't paid much attention to this. Um, I've, I bought a smartwatch a few years ago. Don't wear it much. Actually, don't like wearing it. I don't like having it around my wrist. I feel I, t um, I always, before I had a smartwatch, took my watch off when I went to to bed because I, I didn't like it. it stopped me sleeping or whatever. So I, I came in today not really <laughs> with it um, or, or following um, what it was. So my my question is is sort of two or threefold. One is, um, c could you produce just, just for me, a, a brief synopsis of a, if you are interested, what you've got to do. Uh, B, as someone that might not <laughs> ultimately fully commit, you know, if I really find this is uh, it's not working for me, how 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 much am I stopping someone else who's more committed participating, and should I take that into account? It's a, it's a, it's a solid one. I think, um, and I didn't do what you had to do, because I always feel a bit sleazy, because it feels like salesy, right? So I don't like to do it. But anyway, what you have to do is... Um, Kat's got the answer. Exactly. I was, <laughs> I was literally going to say, between Jane, Kat and I, <laughs> we've got um, a really good plan. But the short version is... Kat, do you want to give it a go? I, I can answer yeah. after. Um, so um, a bunch of you have already expressed your interest in it. Um, so thank you for doing that. An email will be sent around to you all in terms of how you need to officially sign up. Um, for those of you who haven't yet registered your interest, we'll be sending another email again with those details. Um, it will take you through to Orlando's company's website, so Sanius, where you'll have to follow, like you need to agree to sort of data protection stuff, and they will guide you through that process step by step. They've got an amazing customer team who are actually here today at the stand, and they'll be able to help you with any questions you've got, um, and if you've got any difficulties or anything like that, they'll be able to help you with that. Um, and then, yeah, you'll get your watch. And, to, and thanks for that, Kat. It's perfect. And to, the, and to the second question, I wouldn't think about it that way. I would think about it in terms of, um, I think even thinking about wanting to think about you know, your own insights in a different way is a good start. And who knows, right? As I said earlier, some days I forget to put stuff in. Um, I don't ever take it off because like, I've just got a really regimented routine. But. Um, it's got like a 30-day battery life, so you don't have to do lots of charging. So there's lots of things about why we selected it, which is helpful to ensure that it's non-invasive in terms of you know trying to get in your way. Because like you, you've noticed, I've got two. So this I've got to charge every day because we're always testing stuff. Whereas this is like 30 days and it just runs in the background. But even even if you change your mind halfway through, I think it's not a bad thing. I think even asking the question is a good start. <laughs> And it might just be worth nabbing Charles or Orlando just before they leave and seeing whether you can just fiddle around with their watches. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. More questions? Very simple questions. Is it waterproof? Can you have a shower with it? You, 100%. We thought it, we, that was the first thing we thought about. It's waterproof, seaproof, lots of proof. Um, one of the things that we've been doing is... Um, so when we first started, we had um, uh, some patients who, um, in one disease or one condition group, they were on a lot of diff like a cocktail of meds, and those meds um, gave them a sort of slight skin irritation. So we lots of the devices have either got metal straps, which doesn't do that, or stainless steel straps, or something else. But it is waterproof, and you can 100%. You can shower with it, you can swim with it, etc., and you'll be fine. 
<laughs> you happen to show then that you've got the two. You've got. Are they both the same, or is is one an ordinary watch? One no, is no, a special watch. So one's because we're we're always t so Charles gave us a challenge, and lots of our patients have to say, we would like, we've got better watches. Yeah, Charles said. Because I've I mean literally I've only had, I've only been given my Apple Watch as my husband Perfect. as well, given by our children because they were going to to for us to have a safety thing, which only worked indoors, was far, far, far too expensive. So they set us up. So we've only got, you know, it seems a bit of an insult to them to say, sorry, I'm not going to wear it anymore. So could you wear it on the other hand? Or does it I, I, I think we should insult them. And, and I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, I think, I think um, so the, the, I'll give you two answers. One, we are literally, because it's not unique, this question is not unique mm. to you. Um, we're literally working across multiple diseases at the moment to be able to allow people to bring, um, apply their own devices to the ecosystem. The only place that we're not, um, we're still processing this is, as Shirley mentioned, we've got a, um, a sort of clinical or a, a, a trial hap that will happen soon. And within that, I don't know that we know enough yet about the variation in different data sets that will come off of different devices to be able to say we can have different devices in that. But we're hopeful that we'll be able to allow people to bring their own devices, that's the first one. In the interim, however, um, what I do, which is really helpful for me, is I've got two on because I'm trying to calibrate the reading between the two to see what's different, right? But maybe you don't want to do that. But in the short term, we're definitely looking at how we can integrate your device into it so your kids won't be upset. <laughs> <laughs> And Charles wouldn't be upset either. <laughs> Hiya. On one of your graphs, uh, the one with the diseases down the side, different blood cancers down the side, and stuff at the top, the last column was data commercialisation, I think. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, what, we, what we do is everything that we do to, for patients is free, right? And though I um, made a bit of money back in the day, um, it's not sort of Bezos type money, right? So it's not like you know, not like big ship money. So the way in which we um, we um, fund lots of future programs, patients like the WM stuff, etc., or subsidise it, is we only provide insights into industry. And going back to what Jonathan said or Joy said, etc., is. For example, um, and I know some of the team in, in the Netherlands talked about this, there are a lot of therapies in probably this condition and other conditions which are on either an early access medicine scheme or a named patient program, right? And pharma obviously pays for those drugs to be in those programs. They, they can't do anything commercially with it. What we do is we say, if we can tell you without naming anyone, all anonymous. Um, if we can tell you the impact that your therapy is having, then we would like you to be able to pay for that, and we will then use those funds to continue to accelerate research and support patients. So that's what that means in crude terms. But we don't give anyone your data. Just, I can clarify that categorically, ever. <laughs> And I think the last bit on that is we are passionate, and Shirley knows this, ultra passionate about publishing. So in the diseases or the conditions that we're in, I think we're the most published in those diseases about this stuff. Because I think from a patient perspective, I am obsessed with trying to find or at least getting to better therapies to ensure that we're having um, better quality of life while we're on therapy, as opposed to some of the less valuable, um, you know, impacts that we're having at the moment. Yeah, and and I think I I would just sort of finish that session off also by saying that you know we I stand here sort of every year in front of you and I'm trying to share how we're moving it forward, how we're trying to improve things for you, things that are important, and I can go out and build these relationships and find these solutions and and come up with the funding. But ultimately, as I said right at the beginning, we're in partnership and the support I need from you is that you share your data because it's only by you sharing what's happening that we're going to have a better understanding of this disease 
and we're going to be able to move forward and achieve all these things we want to do. So, you know, we're always here to talk. I think just to echo Orlando, all data is always anonymized. We're never giving away your personal data, but the learnings that we can get from you just wearing a watch every day is really going to move us forward. So that would be my plea. Um, as Kat said, we'll send another email next week. It has a link on it. If you're interested, we'll then put you in touch with Sanya. So you have a brilliant onboarding process and um, we'll go from there. But our hope is to have 150 people on a pilot study. We've had 190 people register so far. Um, and then the sort of protocol that Shirley made reference to is we want to move that into a much bigger study that has four to 500 people on it next year. So those are our ambitions around understanding the reality of living with WM right now.